It's having some connection issues for one of our councillors, so we're just taking a couple of minutes in order to be able to make sure everyone is able to fully participate in the meeting. We will start shortly. Can I ask that we please take our seats, please? We'll start this meeting in one minute. Councillor Telfer, Mr. Wilson. Tato. I'll open our no my haramai. I'll open our uh, Thursday, the 18th of May council meeting. Councillor Elder, would you please open our hui with a karakia word, prayer, etc. Uh, thank you, Josh. Um, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us the power and the wisdom to change what is needed to be changed, to look after our hills, rivers, and sea, to make Tairafati our home, the place we all want it to be and need it to be, so that we and all our whānau can live happily and prosper. And help us all be a koha and not a hoha. Amen. Amen. Um, I have apologies here from uh, Her Worship the Mayor, uh, Councillor Cranston, and also apologies for lateness from Councillor Tupara and Councillor Pahura. Do I have a mover? Mover and Councillor Pahuru. Who do I second? Councillor Foster. All those in favour? Uh, all those opposed? Any declarations of interest in regards to anything on the agenda today? Don't have to declare them now. If you think about, you don't have to just declare them now. If you think about them over the course of our agenda, please feel free to bring them up um, over our hui. I'd like to move us to page four, confirmation of a non. So, so just to give some context, we'll go through these functional things first, and then we have a public deputation, which we'll, which we'll get to after these functional things. But I'd like to move us to page four, which is confirmation of our non-confidential. Moved by Councillor Robinson, seconded by Councillor Rear. Any matters arising? If not, all those in favour? Against? Carry. I'd like to take us to the action sheet, page 11. Any matters arising from the action sheet? If not, um, oh, yes, Councillor Gregory. Oh, can I just ask where the governance plan has gone? Well, used to governance have work plan in our agenda. That piece of work hasn't uh, started yet. <laughs> Any other matters arising from our from our action sheet? If not, I would like to. Oh, well, there's no no leave of absence. Oh, sorry, Councillor Pahuru, who do you want? Thank you, Chair. I don't see the action um, sheet, but back on page nine, um, it says under relationships, the report will report to council and will provide more information and background around the joint. Management agreement and the way of the Kokua partnership. It's not in the actions, just. Are we oh, sorry, it is. My mistake. Must be my eyes a bit. My it's, it's, a it's a chilly morning. <laughs> All right, fine. Okay, so we have, I'll move us on in our agenda. No leave, leave of absence. Uh, no acknowledgements or tributes. We have a public input and petition. Are you saying that we should move this uh, as, as part of this? Well, we could, we could take this now and then. Okay. Yep, yep, I'm comfortable with that. Just had advice from, um, from our staff in order to. Uh, Suggesting that we combine this public input and petition with our with our first paper. So what I'll do is I'll actually take us to our first paper, which is on page 12, a de deliberative democracy approach to Tairawhiti climate change adaptation planning. I'd like to um, welcome 
uh, Mr. Caddy and Mr. Loomis to the to the front to present and also coordinate all with us in regards to this paper. So take us to page 12. Welcome, gentlemen. So we'll, we will go through the presentation first and then we'll discuss this paper. Kia ora uh, Thanks for having us. And yeah, I think we were asked to come along and just speak to the paper that's before you uh, so that you're making well-informed decisions and you can ask questions of us. Terry's going to do most of the talking, Dr. Loomis. Uh, and uh, we think it might be about 10 minutes. So I've just started the timer here to keep us on track. Um, and uh, yeah, welcome your comments and questions at the end of the presentation. Just bring the presentation up. Oh, you just start the visual support, you just enjoy the last year. Sweet. Technology sort of there. Uh, let me start by uh, talking about the um, purpose of this uh, project. Uh, go backwards here. There we go. Um, can I start by saying that this, emphasizing this is, as we envision it, uh, an applied research project. In the upper uh, and it's focused on learning how communities can be better supported to lead their own climate change adaptation and transition planning, but also to contribute to the council's council led regional adaptation planning. So that's the general purpose of the uh, project. Uh, get my clicker working here. There we go. Um, talk about community-led adaptation planning. Uh, obviously, we know that communities, Manafenua catchment groups, are expecting to play a role in determining not only how they recover, but how they plan for the future of that adaptation, what's going to happen in their particular area, what impacts are going to come on them. Um, local governments overseas, we've discovered in literature reviews, as well as here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, are beginning to experience experiment with uh, what's called deliberative democracy approach to engaging with communities in response, particularly to the worsening climate crisis. And in summary, a deliberative democracy approach involves citizens coming together to gain a realistic understanding, uh, well-informed, hopefully, understanding of the climate risks that their communities face, to get a chance to assess the options that are before them, and to work with local councils and other stakeholders in their, in their area to implement, hopefully, the best adaptation options. In terms of uh, project design, we envision that there are going to be two stages. The first stage would be a community case study process. We'd have researchers, you might call embedded within those communities, working uh, alongside those communities. And that would take place between roughly June and May next year. And then that will be followed by the second stage which is, uh, would be a citizen assembly. We'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. And that would take place roughly between June and August next year. There'd be quite a bit of preparation involved in that and lots of uh, detailed um, recruitment of the right uh, sort of random sample uh, representatives. And out of that uh, community uh, citizen assembly, would come recommendations uh, from the various uh, communities 
that have been um, in the case study. And those recommendations would come to the council, but also it would hopefully serve, just the publicity of it would serve to encourage wider interest in community adaptation planning and hopefully boost participation in, um, in council-led regional adaptation planning. Right now, it's probably fair to say that adaptation planning properly and uh, formally is not on a lot of people's radar. And so that would, the, the whole publicity around it and what the citizen assembly would be. Can I reiterate one thing in your paper, just to clarify? And that is that communities and groups are at obviously different points in their recovery, their journey toward uh, adaptation and thinking about getting organized to do that. And this research project is not about facilitating that process. It's not about getting involved and leading, helping lead that process. Instead, this project is about observing. It's about being part of that, uh, those communities and gleaning lessons, having conversations and gleaning lessons from those case study communities to share with other communities and also with council in order that we learn how those communities and communities generally can be strengthened in their community-led approaches to working out their own adaptation, uh, adaptation plans. Um, we will have some, well, I should have mentioned on that previous diagram, uh, uh, previous slide, the diagram uh, before you showed uh, the kind of um, analysis process that we're, we would be doing. There are a number of communities across the top. There are some key questions that each community researcher would be responsible for pursuing in order that we have some consistency across all the case studies. And on the right-hand side is represented the gathering of the whole research team together at the end of the process. Actually, we have a midterm gathering and then we'll have an end of the case study process where the whole team would come together and analyze the results across all of those case studies of consistent questions. So the questions that we've currently got in mind are, are uh, these. Uh, the first one is, uh, what are the main barriers to individuals, households, FANO groups uh, participating in adaptation planning and implementation? What, secondly, what works and equally importantly, what doesn't work in promoting greater participation and equally sustaining the leadership that emerges around this process because it's gonna be a taxing and long, long process. And obviously adaptation will go through iterations over the next few years. It won't just be a one-off process. Thirdly, what different approaches to community organize, organizing and planning suit different groups with their different perspectives. Be interesting to know that. Fourthly, how can government agencies, local council, regional authorities, you're both, uh, EWE businesses, improve their coordination and communication so communities can get access to the information that they need, the skills they need, and equally importantly, the resources that they need when they need them. So it's about coordination, how can we, and communication. And fifthly, where do communities get information and assistance, not only about the planning process and techniques of planning, ideas about planning, but, and this is kind of my thing being, being an anthropologist, um, how can communities become aware of the wider interests and, and forces at work uh, bearing on their community. They might be economic, they might be from different sector groups, they might be political influences. A lot of communities I've found plan in, in isolation. They think here we've come up with an adaptation plan, for example, but haven't really looked at the wider influences on their community that could move their path away from what they want to do and they got to do something, something else. And finally, uh, what successes have community advocates had in convincing organizations with influence and public policy decision-making powers like the council to encourage citizen participation 
and support community-led solutions. Uh, the team has had a number of possible case studies under consideration, and Manu can give us a bit of an update on where we're at with that. Yeah, so we're still um, finalizing, and part of today was to, you know, we came to you guys in December, and this is really an update. And if you've got strong views on, on the direction that we're heading, keen to hear that. But at this stage, um, looking at two, possibly three rural communities as in geographic areas, um, one may be a whole um, iwi, and, um, and then we're also looking at the city, um, because the rural communities are actually pretty good at knowing who's where and what's happening and things and, and getting organized, whereas uh, feedback from the um, some key stakeholders is that in the city things are a little bit more um, unorganized and people can get uh, looked over and um, and missed out so uh, the city seems to be an area where we could do some uh, more focus work and we've been talking to uh, the disability community as a particularly vulnerable community within the region um, but looking at them uh, residents with disabilities in the city as one as a sort of community of interest within a geographic community as those that would focus on um, particularly in you know coming out of the cyclones and in that emergency um, but also what support and uh, planning do they need help with um, and what are they doing for themselves around uh, getting better prepared and more resilient going into the future um, of yeah, quite an unknown future so it's kind of so be a a, at least one rural community to the west, one rural community on the coast, and uh, that uh, community of interest within the city is sort of our, our thinking at the moment. Let me say just a word about, uh, I mentioned uh, those stages about uh, the uh, citizen assembly uh, and been having to do some thinking about what a tidafati uh, citizen assembly might might look like. Generally speaking, as I mentioned, a citizen assembly is, is a representative group, I'll say a word about that in a minute, of citizens gathered to consider information, deliberate together, and it can take uh, several days, and propose solutions to complex issues like uh, climate change. A Tairafati citizen assembly would need to be regional in scope, obviously, and uh, would be consistent with uh, Tiziti. It'd be probably 30 or 40 people. They would be meeting face to face and also have the option of Zoom meetings. And it would take place over several days. Those days might be spaced out over a period of perhaps a month, whatever, depending. I mean, our region is spread out quite a way. So we'd have to be realistic. Um, we would want to take some advice from uh, a, a group called uh, Toy2, the Center for Informed Futures at Auckland University. The reason is that they have the, are the latest group that have had quite extensive experience with Citizen Assembly in Auckland, and they've worked with water care to deal with the issue of what water supplies would be available to Auckland 40, 50 years from now. They gathered citizens together and deliberated on options for that over a period of several, several days. Those days were spaced out over about, I think, a month, six weeks, something like that. And they had a couple of Zoom meetings in there as well as face-to-face -face meetings. And uh, they also Zoomed in experts that uh, people who were participating could question and then they continued their deliberation. Uh, they had a focus question, like the one I just mentioned for water, and the one we've been sort of toying with is obviously refinement would be something like this, that the deliberating group would come together. Um, what actions could the council take in collaboration with private and public sector stakeholders to support community adaptation planning and facilitate greater participation in the regional planning process. You might put a question like that to this assembly. They have experts who had 
had experience in working with communities. You would have the researchers from the community case studies coming in and doing presentations. And you might even have people from those communities themselves, probably appropriately, to come in and share their thoughts. The group that was gathered together would have the responsibility over a period of time of deliberating back and forth. There would be a qualified facilitator, uh, according to, to, toy, uh, to toy, uh, toy Two, uh, that would be uh, absolutely necessary because the fur flies, of course, back and forth. But anyway, their job would be to come up with uh, those options and recommendations. There would be some key elements that actually need to be embedded in this uh, uh, citizen assembly. And uh, they sh they're shared with a lot of citizen assemblies. First of all, that uh, citizens would be selected through a random sample process. So when I say representative, I don't mean going around and asking groups to send a representative. It would be a fairly scientific process of using, say, the voter regist registrations or a, a range of options. Uh, phone book is not entirely reliant these days. So uh, they would be invited to participate. And out of that, a group would be winnowed down using random sampling. That's how many Maori Pacific in the community, how many Pacas, how many men and women, and so on, to make sure that the group that finally comes together is reasonably close to the profile of Tairafati. Uh, secondly, they would have an empowered remit, uh, the convening organization, in the case of water care, they themselves committed in advance to considering the recommendations that came out of the citizen assembly and in water care's uh, situation, they actually participated, had staff participating in the whole process. And finally, there would be support for all of those participating in all the ways uh, that they would be needed. Uh, and then maybe finally, just to say the positive results that we would expect to come out of the project, certainly would be hopefully more uh, resilient communities that is uh, strengthened capital, social capital networks, people network more closely together, communicating better, et cetera. Um, the research would provide, a, a, if, if desired, an independent assessment of the, of the official and unofficial recovery activities and adaptation initiatives that council and others are undertaking, which could potentially obviate the need for a separate contracted uh, evaluation of, of those. Uh, fourthly, a relevant uh, refined Tidafferty regional adaptation plan with greater public buy-in. And finally, there could be, hopefully, uh, a shift toward the use of more participatory uh, methods, methods and opportunities for communities to undertake community-led initiatives as part of ongoing council planning. That's about it. Probably just a um, couple of quick comments. The paper that you've got um, asks for some support um, in thinking about sort of what comes out of this process is a, is a few options and you can sort of, um, there's a bit of a continuum of how much uh, uh, power or uh, influence you want to give this assembly. So you could say, we'll take it into account and consideration when we make our decisions, or you could say, unless there's major objections, uh, we will accept the recommendations of this assembly um, and so it's really a way of um, shifting where the decision making gets done on a particular issue from elected representatives to like a jury that we have at court, um, a group of random citizens who are informed um, with great expertise uh, and really deliberate on the, the issues in depth uh, and make a decision. And they're not worried about re-election or anything like that. Uh, and so perhaps their um, views are a little more more pure than politicians sometimes. Um, so that's sort of one of the, uh, the benefits of this, this approach. And as Terry said, it's the kind of thing that if it works well, we can get good at it in the region and, you know, um, and apply it to other issues as well. Uh, and just the other one was on the um, treaty-based approach. We were thinking maybe there's a, a citizens assembly 
uh, taken from the general role and one from the Māori role, who both deliberate separately with similar evidence, and then they come together and deliberate together to and, you know, compare their results and, and see if there's any particular cultural or other uh, factors that mean that they've come up with different solutions or recommendations uh, or you know real close alignment and let's get on with it so yeah, another opportunity sort of another layer of deliberation within the deliberation is is possible so that's something that we've been thinking about but yeah that's a summary of the project and time frames as terry she awesome. thank you very much gentlemen um we have remember this is time for questions we will debate the paper and we can make statements and things like that i'm going to take it a look little bit of an unconventional approach too, and so if it's okay with yourself, Dr. Loomis and Mr. Kenny, I'd, I'd just like to invite you to remain at the table actually while we um, while we discuss the discuss the paper. Um, but questions, Councillor Robinson. Got it. Um, the, the the last proposal you discussed in Manu um, does your funding would your funding your current funding extend to that proposition? We're we're aiming to. Make it so, yeah. All right. Um, and the, the second bullet point up there talks about an independent assessment of official and unofficial recovery activities. But Terry, at the outset, you did say that this mahi wasn't to address recovery activities, but it's it's in there. Can you just clarify where this project is to land on recovery? I'm assuming recovery stories is going to form part of people's background and realities for their corridor onto adaptation planning. But um, that does say an independent assessment of recovery activity. So can you just clarify that please? Yeah, I think our intention would be to focus on adaptation planning. We just see that there's a connection between people's experience in recovery and their thinking about how we're gonna adapt so we don't do that again. But yes, the intention would be not, not to focus on evaluation of recovery initiatives or projects, but to focus on, so what does that mean for adaptation planning and how people engage in it? And remember the focus question, it's about the whole issue of information, communication and coordination. That's, that's the focus of our research. So obviously people will be thinking about recovery and thinking, how was that well coordinated? Did we get the resources when we need them? And then thinking as we move on to Adapt, adaptation planning, similar issues are going to come up about communication information and so on. I think what we're saying is don't expect this to be a formal evaluation of the recovery process. The case studies will obviously include people's experiences in the recovery phase, if that's what we're calling it, over the next um, year. And so that will be informing the process, but it's not an evaluation of, of the process in a systematic way. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to move the paper, as, as I'll be the mover of the paper. I, I think the um, recommendations are, are spot on. I hear what you're saying, Mr. Caddy, about the potential to go beyond uh, taking into account the recommendation. Questions? Like, oh, no, no, I just, that's my cordial appeal on this paper, because we've, so we've blended it all together, as you said, Mr. Chair. Yeah. So I'm happy to move the paper as it stands. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Um, questions? Councillor Gregory, Councillor Rea, Councillor Telford. Councillor. Uh, Thank you. Um, I love this concept and um, I did a, I've had a little bit of a look at how successful it has been. So it's really exciting to see that we're going to be doing this here. Um, I'm just interested in the selection of people for the project. Um, you, it's, you say it's random, but with the expertise. <laughs> How, how does it actually work, the selection of people to be in the citizens assembly? Uh, it's, it's beyond my competence to, to give you any details on this. I'm not a statistician or a, a polling expert, but those that's the area of profession that we would be picking up clues from uh, how to do this. Again, referring back to Auckland University um, and the Center for Informed Futures, they brought in an, an expert um, and uh, on this process, random sample selection. Um, we're talking about stratified random sampling, which means a random sampling is just everybody gets in, the whole population goes in the pot and it's a random selection. In stratified random sampling, you load into the selection 
uh, an analysis of the population. So how many males and how many females live within Tairapati? How many Māori, how many Pākehā, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you could factor in a range of, of issues, but those are the, you know, some of the obvious ones. And then you go out and begin to make your selection and invitation based on that kind of information. Now, getting that information is, is important, but you would use, as I say, databases, you know, like the electoral roll, there, there are several others. And, and as I say, they, you know, Auckland University brought in a specialist and other, but it took several months of iterations to go through this. And they also used WaterCare's uh, client, client base, I think, which was like 60,000 or something like that. So there are a whole range of areas you can get the information. Then do you, you use the phone, you use mail, you, all sorts of ways of getting it. It's not perfect, but at least it begins to, you know, give you a picture of the group coming together being roughly uh, a mirror of the of the whole community. Something like that. So, and the expertise is what gets brought in to present to the citizens. Um, right. So, I, yeah. yeah. Right. Sorry, I that missed that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, and in water care, they brought in people from Australia, from America. They were all over, and they zoomed in, and and. It's like, like Mano says, it's like a jury. Everybody sits back all the, you know, and you can have whatever view you want to, but then the experts are giving you all this stuff. And often they d disagree with one another. And that's when it goes back into the lap of the deliberators to sort of sort out which is better and which, and which aspects are gonna shape that option as opposed to this option. You can see that it could go on and on and on, but it's up to them to do it. By the way, I should mention, that the public would be invited to sit in if they wanted to. We have a responsibility to engage the public, and so the more the better. So when they're seated together, sitting together, the public would be invited. There would be some clear rules, like not screaming and shouting and not involved. You are not to be involved in the process, but you can observe and listen in. So that would be a possibility as well. Hopefully that, I, I dodged your question, but we would be certainly taking advice from the people who've already done it. Awesome. Uh, Councillor Rear, then Councillor Tapo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Tira Tato Tiro Tapo Manuhiri. Um, so Debbie pretty much asked the first question I had. The only the only other question I had was can you give us an idea on how you see possibly what your um, Tangata Fenua engagement might look like? Like what are some of the ideas that you might have? be able to get better tangata whenua engagement through this? Uh, well, I guess um, there's the case study communities. So part of that will be ensuring that uh, the researchers that are involved in that are from those communities and know their communities um, and you know who to go to and who um, make sure, making sure that everybody as much as possible gets the opportunity to participate. Um, and across the, the board. Um, and there will also be in the, um, in the assembly, as I said, the idea of a Māori role assembly and a general role assembly to ensure, and you know, on the general role, there's plenty of tangata whenua as well. Um, so making sure, and as Terry said, ensuring that the selection process uh, is representative of the demographics of the the region so that um yeah in terms of people were there with a special uh group to themselves and the for those that are on the roll and then coming together uh in the combined assembly to deliberate so that, those are the approaches i guess that we're pursuing Kia ora. um i would like I, I i like tony want to support the recommendations <laughs> um bar point three with that take account to take account because I, I do believe that it's really um, this kind of change in terms of our um, climate change and our climate change strategy it's really imperative right now it, it, it has to happen so when an, an item like this comes across the table I don't want us to sit here and say oh we're going to take into account mm. that 
that actually we are going to do more than just take into account that Te Weo's project won't sit alone, like a lone wolf, but combined with other initiatives that we have across that an actual plan is going to come out of the recommendations that our local community groups make. Okay. Kia ora. Kia ora, Councillor Rea. Councillor Telfer, then Councillor Tupara, and Councillor Thompson. Yeah, um, just to my, um, look, I agree. Look, I like the whole approach. Mm -hmm. but, um, um, yeah, I like the whole approach. Um, I totally agree. This is a, like a relatively new thing coming coming to us, a new way of doing it. And I wouldn't like to go and um, lock and load ourselves to say we are going to take these recommendations and put them in because it's dangerous. Um, but I would like to, I, would, I totally agree, and I'd like to not be willing to take note of these. I think that it needs to be a bit stronger than that. Um, so that we, yeah, we, we take what is good out of it and we really try and work with to take it first because there'll be more of this stuff coming i think this is a, probably a good way um, to look at it for the future with all all groups and the whole community involved so that would be my one i, I um yeah I, I don't want to disappoint you by just saying we will take note i don't mean it like that but i think um to actually back yourselves into a total court would be would be irresponsible so thank you very much councillor Telfer, um <coughs> councillor tupara and then councillor thompson and then Councillor Foster. Namahi ki ki a koutou, na manuhiri. Um, my apologies for lateness. Um, so I did miss most of your, your presentation, but I did read the report. And um, from the report, I note that um, in the in the Porirua District Council, um, they had discussions iwi specific, uh, particularly with Ngāti Toa. And I was wondering whether or not um, the values they got from that, if any, you were able to share with us um, this morning. Yeah, um, with, with, within um, the point of um, how we might better engage with our iwi specific here, um, the report focuses on the use of the term Māori, um, which has a, a positive spin. Um, but yesterday we um, had a workshop around strategic risk, and there does seem to be, from that discussion, um, some divide um, between councils way of progressing and Iwi's um, thoughts on that. And um, so be keen to, to know how Porirua District Council um, dealt with its Iwi specific um, groupings, particularly Ngāti Tōr. Awesome. Um, Councillor Tupara. We'll take that on board and look so, into it. We certainly have uh, looked at the Porirua experience and that was actually co-sponsored by uh, uh, Ngāti Tōr and uh, how they did that and how they looked at the design together would be interesting. Uh, earlier the better, I think, to get uh, Tangata Tanda involved. Um, Councillor Thompson, then Councillor Foster. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Um, I love the idea of the two different groups and then coming together and seeing the similarities and how they differ and sort of give you Two, two samples, I suppose. Um, my question is, you talk about uh, random selection. What, what is there for that random selection of people to be engaged, have, have buy-in into this? Are they mm. paid or what, what, what's... Yeah, uh, yeah they, uh, they would be given a koha, all their expenses would be covered, babysitting whatever they required would be. So that wouldn't be an issue in their decision to participate, but all the people contacted would be given a choice of whether they would uh, participate or not. Um, the uh, participation would be winnowed down in stages, I, I would suspect from a total population or as big a population sample as possible across the whole region down to those that meet the criteria that we'd be screening for. That is, we wouldn't want, you know, up to 40 people, we wouldn't want 35 males and five females. We wouldn't want, you know, uh, monophenol being, you know, dominant over the whole, you know, whole process, et cetera, or vice versa. So that's the next stage of the process and the specialists doing the contact. And you'd have to get a bank of you know, people involved in phoning and contacting and sending out mail. It, it, as I said earlier, 
we may hold the citizen assembly middle of next year, but there's a big lead up time, all of it mostly spent as you're questioning about making sure we get the mix right. But the representatives would not be representatives of groups, they'd be representative of the whole population, which means it's a bit tricky. So, so we'd, we'd be looking at compensating them for their time and like a like a again like a court jury um and that may rule some people out because they can't get the time off with or you know that even though we're paying them it's just for, for whatever reason that you know so there'll be a it's like a funnel and a sort of a, a screening along the way so thank you uh councillor foster yeah, awesome initiative um i love the whole um Particip deliberative participation, democracy, the whole, you know, it's, it's a fantastic. Um, my question is, uh, uh, you know, we've got lobby groups already, look like the Federated Farmers, um, you know, Forest and Bird, and a whole lot of other different organisations around the place. Will you be utilising the strengths of those um, organisations to, to, for your cause? No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess this is sort of, it's really um, trying to get around those vested interests groups yeah. in a way, in the same way that it's getting around the elected yeah. representatives as the decision makers, yeah. not completely. Um, and so it's when we have been approached after our presentation last December um, by some groups saying, oh, you know, we're special, we, you know, how are we going to be involved in this? Yeah. And we said, thank you very much. But, you know, we've got this process, which is designed to be much more democratic or as democratic as it can be. Yeah. Um, and it's not about those particular interest but well I guess where we would use them is if they do have particular expertise they come yeah, as experts come, yeah, to right. present a particular yeah. view on on the issue um rather than sitting around the table as with their with their interest group panel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah cool awesome fantastic awesome thank you very much the councillor Foster I have a couple of um questions how in our recommendations it, it asks us to have um uh designate representatives, so I'm assuming council representatives, to attend the citizen assembly. Do you have any ideas around the ideal kind of council representatives that we should be sending? Are you thinking that they're elected members or the ops or, you know, do we go through our own deliberative democracy process to <laughs> determine who from inside this organisation? I think we'll come back to you on that. It's still a year at least away, so um, give us some time to to work through some suggestions around it. Yeah, certainly in, in the water care case, they had both. They had senior staff as, as well as as uh, board representatives. So it, it would be something we'd have to deliberate, something for you to decide as well. Obviously, being part of the process would be better than just waiting till the end and you know, seeing what the recommendations were. Well, also, second, um, second question. Uh, you had referred to the work that Toy 2 had done from uh, Auckland Uni. Did they have, had they given you any indication of, of cost in regards to fairly compensating whānau that participate, our, our citizens that are participating inside of this assembly? Is there any like indication in regards to that at the, at the moment? No, I don't think. Well, not yet. No, we have That will come out of the Right, we're going to talk for a little bit then. Um, that's great. If there's, we're, we're oh, Councillor Parat. Morena Aroha Mai. I'm so sorry that I missed the beginning of the presentation, um, and appreciate you coming in and, and talking about this really important kaupapa. My part I actually was just about the communities being considered, um, and I just on a personal note, why um, Makarika and Tapu Wairua are split as opposed to being the Ruatoria kind of catchment. Why, why focus on those two particular areas as being, uh, yeah, focuses mm. for case studies? I guess it was uh, trying to make it manageable and get really good engagement. So uh, speaking to, yeah, and I sort of didn't want to get too deep because we we're still in discussions with some of those um, communities. But um, yeah, it was about getting quite sort of particular and so in the case of marketing there might be 90 households that we can get around all of those and get quite good engagement and understanding if we try to do all real authority we just don't have the resource to do the wild valley sort of uh, approach so that was probably the and also places like tupar or or um Tapuair or sometimes maybe get overlooked in the bigger scheme of things like it'd be great to have a project that just focuses on the Tapuair or valley community and 
you know, see what their issues and opportunities are. I can absolutely appreciate that then. Can the same thought be applied to Muriwai, to Gisborne City? If, if we want a deep focus of them, we're going to split a community as small as we're talking to get that deep focus. Can that same principle be applied to the other areas? Yeah. Um, Atui I, I, I support the kaupapa. I, I'm really passionate about liberative democracy. Um, mm -hmm. My part I really is around how do you intend to engage? I know specifically places like Tapuwairo and parts of Maparika, people have difficulties engaging or being interpreted. Um, they have their whakaaro, they're not always confident in being able to deliver that. Do you, just does the team um, have or will have the ability to engage in that level at that grassroots mm. and, and how might yeah. you approach that? Yeah. And I, you might have missed where I said the researchers themselves will be from those in, living in those communities, so they should have a pretty good handle on how to engage, hopefully. And, and also, we're, we've got a training package to put together depending on which communities and which people are you know, engaged, but um, they would be involved in uh, doing a structured interviews or conversations, but also, again, being an anthropologist, I've been pushing for participant observation as well, which means they're part of the process in the community, if they're gatherings, if they're meetings, if they're you know, planning, whatever, they'd actually be part of that process and engaging and conversing with people. So hopefully they're gonna pick up, our problem is gonna be, I think, how to get through all of the data and information that's gonna come flooding in about people's impressions, and as well as answering some of those six questions. Uh, how we get together at the end and try to make sense of it all and then send it on to the citizen assembly is going to be a big challenge. Papai, just one last thing. Um, as, as climate change becomes such an important part of, of life here in Te Pairawhiti, um, and this kaupapa in itself being so important, I wonder if there's an opportunity to bring in um, not necessarily rangatahi, but people who might be very early on in their career to sit alongside this kaupapa. There's, we have to think about building um, capability and capacity into Tairawhiti. We can't have the same people doing all the mahi, yep. as you all well know, Manu. Um, <laughs> yes, I do uh, well with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I'd just like to, to turn all that to the kaupapa to see if there's a way to bring in some, some young people who are in the beginning of their career that could get a lot out of this, and then we can also use them for various yeah. kaupapa. <laughs> <laughs> that has been our thinking, was that we'd focus on young ones who are going to be holding the space much longer than some of us, um, so that they're involved in that early on. Uh, yeah, and we've also got ones like Dr. Fiona Temomo, who's helping sort of provide supervision at the other end of her career. She's not that old, but. <laughs> Kia ora. Um, I am going to actually, oh, Councillor Tupu. Thank you very much for the presentation this morning, Tina Gorua. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Perhaps I'll put the first one forward. Um, can you explain the whakapapa of the citizens of assembly? Oh, it goes back a ways, uh, but I would say the first, the first that I found in the literature review goes back about 20 years, 20, 25 years, and started in the Midwest of America when um, a particular organization, uh, the Something Foundation, yeah. no, it was another, another group in Minneapolis, began to experiment uh, with national elections in America and engaging citizens in discussing key issues about the, the elections. So it was sort of a random selection, again, using similar methodologies. And then they began to think, well, hey, we can you know, adapt this process of getting people together you know, selectively to debate other issues that are important, like a small community and they're gonna have a, I don't know, a big, a big subdivision uh, put in or a mine or something that near the community or an industrial estate. And all of a sudden the community gets upset. Possibly this is a way. And so they've done that more recently. And I'm particularly thinking about my home state, Minnesota, used to be home state. Uh, they've used a number of these in rural areas to do exactly what we're talking about, engaging in climate change issues. I think again, driven by the urgency of doing that. 
They did, fortunately, the same foundation managed to get buy-in from the state uh, government. Um, so they had an assembly in uh, St. Paul where a lot of these uh, small uh, gatherings provided input and made recommendations to the legislature. So that's my knowledge of it, but it's been, it's been done overseas as well. We've got the Puerto Rico example, which, which they called Talanoa, which, but which is similar to this. Some of the earliest uh, experiments actually happened in Aotearoa in the early 90s with um, Christchurch City Council and Mayor Vicky Buck around participatory budgets. And so that was rather than you guys deciding on the budget and the staff. Again, it's a citizen's approach to working out what the priorities are for where the public money should be spent. And that was actually, it's been used as a global model that's been applied around the, the world since. But if you go back right back, you know, back to Athens and things, in some ways that sort of, the forum was a citizen's assembly of um, deliberate, deliberating if you're a male um, citizen yeah. of the city uh, <laughs> on, on the issues. Yeah. So it's just it's another step in our evolution, hopefully, of democracy, and um, and if we can do more experiments and refine our process and build capability in the the region, then we can do more of it. Hopefully, if it works well, if it doesn't, stick with the status quo. <clears throat> I just wanted to say that um, I just had a quick look in a bit of the literature that deliberative democracy and participatory democracy. The gap in the Toy 2 case of water care was that um, there's the power in belts and the deliberations between the groups. What I think is a possibility of consideration in this one that I haven't heard discussed yet is <clears throat> if our population is largely 72.7 based urban, then that means the remainder is of course rural and the gap that could exist as it does between deliberative democracy and participatory democracy is, how you then feature in, given that the majority of the density of who um, lives in the Tairafti sits in the urban space, that the rural um, reality may be obfuscated in the discussions, and that's a high risk to me. Um, what I also think is interesting, which you just raised in the um, realization that you want to use young people across these spaces is that if you look at the demographic of our population age, then 39% of us are in the 25 years and younger. And I wonder because in the work I do, what I get to see is that there's always at least 10 decades of mindsets across a piece of work in the um, communities and cohorts I work with. And I wonder upon, <clears throat> The point that you raised that the young people who will deal with the outcomes of these adaptation plans are largely going to be that 39% under 25. I know that to we already factors that in, but then again, it becomes a heavy weighting in terms of the deliberative democracy, the participatory democracy, um, the tyranny between the urban critical mass versus the, ru the rural critical mass, and then again, add the next layer on that in terms of uh, treaty and tangata whenua aspects that um, there's a whole lot that needs to be factored into that and can create high risk for Māori population in the understanding of that. So um, I welcome the fact that we require to pull more community voices so that the voices um, of the people who will be the beneficiaries in the end of an adaptation plan properly factor the swaying towards the younger generation as the recipients of this critical value. And then secondly, make sure that um, tangata whenua yet again through participatory and deliberative democracy processes are not again obfuscated. Kia ora. Thank you. Kia ora, Councillor Tibble. <clears throat> um, just quickly, you know, and we can apply an equity lens to the selection process and we can do weightings and things, but I think one of the, the, the points of this process of deliberation, like a court jury again, is a building a consensus, so it's not about a majority vote in these processes, it's about trying to find a, the common ground, um, so while rural communities might be a minority based on those demographics, actually a fair voice is a dissenting one, they keep deliberating until they've found a, a way through that the, the rural communities are, are happy with. So that's sort of some of the ways that we can address those concerns. Yeah, There's also, sorry, and also thinking about the young ones, given that it looks like the legislation is going to go to 16 for voting, but our 
electoral rolls will only have 18 and above, we might need to think about that sort of um, 16 to 18 year old group being included somehow in the in this uh, uh, selection process. Awesome, awesome. Kia ora, Mr. Caddy. Um, anyone that hasn't spoken? I just wanted to second the paper, thank you. Uh, anyone that hasn't spoken that wants to have a quick word? If not, I'm actually going to circle back to what has been kind of signalled by Mr. Caddy and also by Councillor Rear in regards to um, recommendation number three. Um, it's the, the recommendation has already been moved and seconded. Well, the second did come very late, so it should shoot them, but I will because I'm very fine. Um, the, I, I wanted to know if we were comfortable with having the discussion around taking into account being stronger, because um, I'm, I'm definitely comfortable with that, but I wanted to throw to um, our staff to see if they had any recommendations or ideas in regards to strengthening up that part, if the mover and second are comfortable with that. Yes, we should debate that point and have the input from staff. Thank you, so through you, Chair. Uh, an option there, if you want to make that wording stronger and to borrow something from the Resource Management Act, you could have recognise and provide for instead of take into account. So that means you really have a duty to actively consider and actively provide and recognize for those recommendations rather than it being a factor you take into account in your decision making. Um, so that, that wording is um, a very use in the RMA? Yep. Yeah. Well, I would be happy to move an amendment to number three to incorporate those um, terms. So agrees to recognize and, and provide, provide for the recommendations of the assembly. Yep. Does that have the support of the second Do any other further debate in regards to that? I think the paper has been well debated and it really sounds like there's, there's uh, consensus and strong support for these recommendations. So I'd like to, um, Councillor Tupara. Just a point, um, Josh, I'm not even sure what to call you, Josh, your worship. Nephew. Chair, nephew. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Because um, um, running up to this point, it was just questions to the presenters. Um, and um, are we now seeing that contribution as the um, debate that we would have around um, this particular report? Oh, I'm, I'm um, like, yeah, it, it had started to become a lot of statements also inside of, inside of the cordial. So, the, so if you do feel like you have some statements to make or some debates to make, feel free to, to make them now, um, please, Councillor Tupara, I would hate for you to think that you weren't able to participate in this discussion. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do have a number of points. Um, Auckland University seems to be the lead, the lead um, uh, academic around um, the delivery of this. And I um, do have a question around why Auckland University is deemed to be the appropriate institution particularly given um, that we have wānana um, that um, could equally be up to the task, if not more so, particularly reflecting um, the community here at the Tate Office. And so I would ask whether or not there are other more appropriate institutions, uh, learned um, institutions that might fulfil that space, such as um, our wānana. Um, I also have a facado around um, the terms used in the report, citizens assembly, it does sound very much like it has a classical Roman origin, um, which as we know through our understanding of history, came with an incredible amount of bias. And some of that bias is pointed out by and the authors of the report there. Um, my preference would be to consider other um, types of terminology when we're addressing these matters for the Tairawhiti. And uh, one that comes to, um, to mind is runana, which has always been well used and we probably wouldn't want to go there. <laughs> but another comes to mind is kahui. And um, kahui is a gathering, a collective, is a, a space for sharing 
but also a description of the activity of that. And that the, the report, for me, doesn't reflect enough of, of our character as a trader. Um, I do note um, during question time that um, the discussion uh, briefly around Porirua Council and Ngāti Toa, and that the use um, and collaboration of iwi and council um, as co-sponsors of, of the, this directive, I think is a, a significant um, um, point to make that has worked for other councils in the parks and um, that might be something for council to consider here. Um, the other thing for me, um, a citizen's assembly, this is a citizen's assembly. This assembly has been um, assembled by the citizens of the Tate office. Um, it, it appears that it um, confesses to be lacking in some areas and so requires the addition of a kahui um, to, to afi it in its duty. And um, I think that's a very serious and quite impactful um, path to take. And um, because it does suggest a displacement of some of the responsibilities of this, this kahui. And um, it was raised by Councillor Thompson in our deliberations yesterday about um, the democracy that exists. And whilst this, um, on the face of it, does look like a, an excellent way to share in, in democracy, um, I think it's, it's something that comes with great responsibility on both sides of that. And um, I don't think the report dives deeply enough into that. I am heartened, however, um, by the, um, our visitors' comment that the um, akahui would, may come from the general role and one might come from the Māori role. I think that's an exceptional suggestion um, should we, we go forward um, with this and, and would like to encourage that to happen. But my main motivation for my comments comes from last night I happened upon a um, a, a documentary um, talking of the path of one of our rangatai from Ruatoria, Kaya Hills, on, on um, looking to um, discover who he was or who this person is. And um, I'm extremely concerned that these types of um, random selections miss some of the very significant members of our community. And um, somebody like um, the nephew um, comes with a very special character, um, one that um, really struggles to find a sense of existence in our community. I'm concerned with those minority groups missing. And um, as a, a member from the Māori ward, um, the struggle that has been in place to get a Māori, Māori ward-based councillors at this table and how long and how difficult and um, that has been to create an assembly that um, in this report at least doesn't feel robust enough to be fully inclusive. And the terms that have been used in our, in our question time were things like a balance of male and female. We are far more than just that. Balance of older and younger. We were far more than that. Um, disability um, was raised um, as, a, as an area of some special attention. Um, we are at risk of missing so much of our community when we attempt to assemble what our community looks like. And for Māori in particular, that has always been a struggle. Mm. And for, for, for youth and those of, with gender fluidity have always been, been a struggle. I don't, I'm anxious about creating a forum that drags all of that stuff through. Unless we're very robust in the way that we do that. Kia ora, Councillor Tupata. Thank you for sharing your concerns. Did you want to respond to this? Yeah, yeah, Eddie, happy to, um, just quickly. Um, I think the issue, the question around other great points, um, 
agree with all of them. The uh, institutions question, though, I think uh, unless those Wananga have produced academic um, studies and projects around this kaupapa, I'd um, defer to those that have spent the time doing that, and there's many more than just University of Auckland. Um, they happen to be one of the most recent, um, and so we're keen to learn from that experience, but if the Honourable Member knows of uh, other experiences and projects at the Wānangas, then happy to talk to them um, and point us to the, um, the evidence around that. Um, regardless, though, I'm sure the Wānanga have useful things to contribute and uh, it would be great to have some academic uh, institutions connected to the project and we'll approach all of them to see if they have the capability and capacity to, to do so. Um, I agree that we've struggled with the terminology. Citizens Assembly does not feel like it fits here particularly comfortably, and uh, we just haven't put the time in yet to work out what a, a better kupu would be. Kahu is good. Runanga is actually what existed here before local government. You know, around the coast, there were Runanga in every village that deliberated on the issues of the day and worked out stuff for their community. So, in a sense, that is the, the best kupu. Uh, as you say, it could be a bit confusing, though, so Kahu may help to differentiate um, and uh, agree that this proposal is a bit of a challenge to representative democracy, that this deliberative and participatory democracy is saying actually electing representatives every three years, you know, a small number to make all the decisions on behalf of everyone uh, is not a perfect system and we can probably do a bit better than, than what we've got. And uh, this is an experiment in that uh, alternative, one alternative. Um, there will be many others. And as Terry said, it's not a perfect process. There will be gaps um, and it's not a fully participatory process with every citizen in the, the region contributing uh, in depth, um, unless you've got the resources to do that. We'd be happy to give that a go. But for now, it's uh, the next best thing and a move on from uh, electing you guys um, on this particular issue. Uh, and seeing if there's a, another way of doing things and decision making uh, within the community. Ultimately, you guys will still have the power, as you've said, to um, make provisions for, but um, hopefully helps us in our journey as a region to uh, evolve and improve the way that we do make those decisions on public policy. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Caddy. Um, any right of reply, Councillor Robinson, after this, there's no other. Um, space, so write a reply, and then I'll put the paper. Thank you. Um, thank you for your response, uh, Mr. Carey. I just wanted to share my thoughts on um, Councillor Tupada's um, comment on the, dis on the displacement of our responsibilities. I don't see this project as a displacement of our responsibility. Uh, I see that it would build on and add to and enable us to be better governance. Um, and so I, I, I think I fully support the papers and the project. Thank you very much, Councillor Robinson. Um, I will now put the paper. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Let's have uh, a cup of tea. All right. Kia ora no whanau. Um, Councillor Tupara, you have a, a comment to make. Just a quick follow on from um, our previous report and the question posed back to me about a, a, an appropriate uh, Wānanga institution that might be able to participate in, in the report. And my whakaro over cup of tea was a peer review. And, and I would like to suggest a peer reviewer uh, from, from here, from the Taita Fiti, Linda Smith, who has just mm. um, recently been appointed as a lifetime international member of the United States National Academy of Science. Yes. As okay. an appropriately qualified person who might be able to lean in on this space and, and have maybe a peer reviewer supervisionary um, glance over, over the development of the report. Awesome. Thank you. Sure Councillor Tupara, I'm sure that we can pass that on to uh, Mr. Caddy and Dr. Lunas. But also on that note, you know, it's actually Nera Timihi Nunui Kia Foka Linda. Um, you know, that's a huge, huge achievement. Her entire life has been around Indigenous science. Uh, so, yeah, absolute huge achievement and, and awesome for us here on the coast. As, uh, you know, she's, she's one of our, our tongue. We claim her all the time. So, awesome, awesome Koka Linda. 
Um, I would like to take us to page 21, report 112. Now, so just, just to inform us that this is a noting report. So these recommendations, uh, the recommendation is to note the contents of the report. The purpose of the report is really just to get our initial steer, right? Um, and to give staff an initial steer in regards to feedback around this national planning framework. And oh, actually, I'll hand it over to, to, to Ms. Noble to give us more in regards to that. Morena Tato. So the Ministry for the Environment has recently released this dis discussion document, document on the proposed national planning framework. And we wanted to bring it to your attention early. This, you know, there's no formal consultation or submission process yet that will be run through a board of inquiry once the legislation has passed, assuming it, it's passed. So MFE are proceeding on, on that basis. Um, so we really wanted to get the report to you early just to give you a chance to let, give some direction as to, is this something that's of importance? And then if it is, are there any areas you wish council to focus on or is everything listed in the document of equal importance? Because it is quite a weighty piece of material. There's a lot in there. Um, we could spend, you know, a considerable amount of time on this, on this piece of work. Um, so really looking for that early steer. So when we do come back to you with, with some more detailed analysis, we've hopefully hit the right spots and the right balance. And, and just to clarify, we, so what you're proposing is us to give an initial steer for this paper and then staff we, to go away, do some work, and then you'll come back and workshop that more. Yeah, it will likely us. be a workshop. Yeah, yeah, okay. because it is quite a, a chunky piece of work and yeah, okay. timing un, unclear as yet, but we'll, we'll definitely come back. Right. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Noble. So, yeah, so just initial steer in regards to this uh, feedback in regards to this piece of um, uh, net, this national planning framework. Councillor Robinson, then Councillor Rear, Councillor Foster, Councillor Tuff. Right, yeah. Councillor Robinson. Uh, thank you, Ms. Noble. Um, I pride myself on being good with words and, and mildly clever, but this was a tough read. <laughs> Um, you know, I struggled literally with every paragraph because of the jargon. It was just so unfamiliar to me. And when I when I looked at the recommendations, I was like, well, I can't tell you what's missing. I can't barely read it. Um, so, I mean, you, the staff have gone through and pulled out from paragraphs 15 to 24 some key, some key red flags. Mm. Me, at this point, I will be guided by staff seriously as to um, where you think we should be uh, raising matters up the flagpole. Be honestly, because I'm so out of my depth on this, uh, I will defer to the experts this once, okay? <laughs> Thank you very Thank much, you. Councillor Robertson. I, I total um, that, that for Carl in regards to um, taking staff's lead. Councillor Rhea. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Tina Tato, I completely agree with what Tony has just said. Um, I appreciated the, um, the high level commentary that staff provided, and I, I actually used their recommendations to then refer to the document because it was hard to read the document and to find what was and was, wasn't in there because of the language, and, and recognizing that all the areas that they identified are areas that we have previously discussed on many different kaupapa and decisions, and that are important to us. So I too am happy to, oh, I want to move in, uh, recognize that we note the contents of the report mm -hmm. and would like to support our staff in um, doing the detailed analysis. Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor uh, Councillor Foster, the Councillor Talfa, and Councillor Thompson. From what we've experienced over the last few years um, with climate change and everything like that, and with the um, consequences of the Resource Management Act and um, implementation of uh, different parts of that to our region, I, I am really um, quite, um, I know there's, there needs to be some different framework, but when you've got national planning framework and that we're all categorized as a one size fits all, I've got alarm bells ringing over me. Yes. And, uh, you know, so I know, I know, we're, you know, nationally, they're trying to head in a really good direction, but I would just hope that our, um, for the resource management plan 
um, can fit into these different categories and we can strengthen um, the parts of it that we need to to protect our region you know so um, ha having been a, um, a commissioner for quite a few years and uh, seen all the different effects that this region in particular has had from some of the flawed um, parts of the RMA in the past uh, yeah I I welcome I, I welcome change but I'm still got alarm bells ringing how the implementation might be and I'm really um, hopefully the staff can uh, um, benefit from the from the new legislation that's been proposed because there is certainly some good stuff in here but the, the interpretation of it is what what we um, we want. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Kilda Councillor Foster, Councillor Telford, and Councillor Thompson. Yeah, um, um, page 26, uh, page 26. Um, around there's no not any content proposed for specific energy land use to limit the starters and sediment and woody debris. Um, I think that leads on from where um, Councillor Foster was looking at it. It is I think if we've all read this report that's come out, this is a classic example of one um, one national um, policy fits all. And, and I think we need to really push back on that. Um, not so much making it specifically about woody debris, but about land, um, being able to set um, rules around land use within our own catchment. And I think that's probably the biggest thing and, and whatever comes because we're we're looking at things that happened 25 years ago, um, 80 years ago, 200 years ago, decisions that were made that actually then affect us down the track and a lot of us aren't there when the consequences arrive and, and we won't be there for the consequences to arrive. So I think if we can really, if there's one thing we can do is to push back and try and get some framework around being able to set rules within catchment because what works here um, or what works in Southland um, doesn't necessarily work here, and I think that's what's come through that report. Um, and, and if while the fire is hot, I think there's a golden opportunity to maybe head in that direction. Go to Councillor Telfer, Councillor Thompson, then Councillor Tupara. Yeah, um, what I was about to say has just been covered by <laughs> Councillor Telfer. Um, but I, I'd just like to add that. I don't really want to put too much effort into emissions reduction. Like we're, we're zero point one seven of a percent um, New Zealand, so we're we're a grain of sand on the beach. So I, I don't think we should be putting too much emphasis on de definitely on uh, de de dealing with it. But in terms of the reduction, I don't think we're going to make any difference. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Tupara. I did skim through because it was a skimmy kind of um, report um, and, and gave a particular focus, however, on the cultural heritage section. And um, um, it seems somewhat short of clear definitions of what culture, heritage, and particularly the values around culture and heritage may be. I suspect that in looking at the, the statements made there, that much of that will come from um, Ministry of Culture and Heritage um, definitions for these things, or possibly even um, Heritage New Zealand. Um, I'm a little bit concerned with that. Um, I, I would like to hope that um, regionally we could help define what those um, items mean for the Te Rāwhiti, um, particularly um, with regard to um, the Māori cultural heritage values on, uh, in the coast. Um, my understanding, particularly at an archaeological level, um, Māori cultural heritage is the highest percentage of cultural heritage in the Tairawhiti. And um, I think it warrants a, a very clear defining of what those terms mean so that we can then better evaluate the impacts um, the this um, process might have on, on those particular items. And also um, how we define conservation. And my understanding is that typically um, definition for that comes from museum trained conservators and um, uh, it's quite a specific type of heritage, cultural heritage institution and has quite a specific 
whakaro around what conservation of that heritage looks like. And most of our, um, the majority of our cultural heritage already identified, particularly through archaeology, um, is external to institutions, sits on private property, sits on Māori land, um, sits out in the environment, and differs quite markedly from the conservation practice in a built environment like a museum, as opposed to what is typically here in the Tainafati. And so just a consideration for a, a deeper, slightly deeper dive into, into that particular area. Thank you. Councillor Gregory. Uh, thank you. I just wish to second the um, motion and look forward to the next um, uh, report with some one staff as, and some detail has come out. Thanks. So thank you, Councillor Gregory. Councillor Elder. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'm pleased to hear it took Councillor Robinson longer than 10 minutes to read this one. Uh, um, on that one, Councillor <laughs> Alder. Um, I've got lots of notes beside it. I'm really looking forward to the workshop um, and areas of transparency and of land use in particular. I think, you know, there's an opportunity here to at least try and influence change. So I'm happy to cheers. Councillor Parata. Um, Morena, I just take for everything that's been said around this table and I just take this opportunity to note that um, there have been a lot of difficult conversations around council um, for the last wee while, particularly this year and staff have had it really difficult. Um, this report really highlights to me that we have some really incredible experts um, among us that um, that are subject matter experts in their field and I just want to take this time actually to acknowledge um, the mahi and the prowess that exists inside um, the Gisborne District Council and amongst our staff um, and would absolutely appreciate um, the opportunity to have a workshop and be taught um, by our staff so that we can make good governance decisions. Thank you, Councillor Parata. Um, there's no other call at all. I, I do want to thank staff for the early engagement. Uh, it's it's always good. I'm of the view that it's always good to just come first and check. Even if like, even if we're like, now, nah, sweet as we'll take your we'll take your guys' uh, advice on it. Um, but one thing that has re been really clear around the table was actually, and, and which I also agree with, is that the the um, the need for us here in region to be able to have region specific planning frameworks. You know. Um, it's the national planning stuff that really gets us pushed into a corner. Um, and really, yeah, we get painted into a corner by national planning uh, frameworks. I would love for there to be a strong voice. Uh, I'd love to hear from staff in regards to uh, your guys' recommendations and the things that we should be sending to central government to really strongly uh, send the message and send examples of of, of how we can strengthen our own ability to regionally plan by our region, for our region, with our region. If there are no other, if there's no other quarter or fun, we have a mover and Councillor Rear and a seconder and Councillor Gregory. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Carry. All right, I'll take us to page 75, which is a local governance statement. Uh, who will be speaking to this? Mr. Bay. Hey. Yes, Mr. Bain. Yeah, kia ora through the chair. I'll take the report as read. Um, you can see that the report traverses some of the timeframes associated with the local governance statement, um, impact of cyclones, and um, we understand that DIA will hopefully be using the emergency legislation to retrospectively apply uh, to the timeframes around this. Um, the statement itself it just draws together a lot of information in terms of requirements um, on council, um, in terms of uh, our, our sort of inter interface with the public, et cetera, and things that we need to do. It should be taken as a statement as opposed to our performance against those statements. So I'll just put that, put that there as well. Awesome, thank you very much, Mr. Bailey. So to give this 
paper context, this is our collection of information that we need to send to DIA. It's, it's actually a public document. So I kind of look at these statements as more something we put together for public, for the public, as much as it is our document and things that we need to be doing. Um, it's really for public consumption more than anything. So they understand, you know, some of the um, structures and mechanisms, mechanisms, yes. Mechanisms. Yes, mechanisms that we um, we operate by. Any questions or quoted or Councillor Robinson, Councillor Gregory. Thank you. I've um, I've identified some grammatical errors in the document which I'll just share with you uh, outside of this space. But if I take you to um, if I take you to page ninety one, um, giving effect to tetriti, and the second. Uh, section there headed statutory acknowledgements uh, does has a reference to the RMA and I'm just wondering why we're not I mean okay so it, it talks about including but not limited to the uh, LGA and the RMA expressly then recognizes the section of the RMA I don't know why it doesn't expressly recognize say sections 4 77 and 81 of the LGA which are which are you know Maori specific um, empowerment and enabling clauses. So um, it, it may be for strategic reasons why it's not there, but I just thought that would have been an appropriate place to have um, acknowledged those statutory um, overlays, as it were. Yeah, point taken. I don't know. Um, anyway, just, just my thoughts. Yeah. Um, other than that, I think it's a really, really great document, and I'm, I'm really proud that it would be put out to our community on behalf of us. Awesome, thank you. I'll very share much. the typos with you after. Thank you very much, Councillor Robinson. Councillor Gregory. Uh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, I know that a lot's gone on since we were elected, but um, in the document, it talks about our code of conduct and standing orders. And I understood that at some time we were going to review those with our new council. And I'm just hoping that this doesn't tie us into what, what and we might at some point do that without any pressure because I know it's been tough. Uh, yeah, happy to respond to that. No, this document won't um, concrete us and we can review a, a number of um, related policies that are caught in this document at any point in time. So we do have those two documents and those matters still on our agenda. Um, slightly delayed obviously with, with um, cyclone impacts, but they remain there and we're still committed to, to going through that process with the current council. Councillor Rhea. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Kia ora tato. I, I too sent a little fixer uppers through to Heather prior. Um, Engari, my partai was around our tangata whenua for regional iwi. So um, when I asked that, that uh, those stats were collected from Statistics NZ, when I checked Statistics NZ, the stats from the last um, census registered five iwi and within um, hui that we've actually had here we've acknowledged seven iwi so I'm just <laughs> looking at four regional iwi and I'm wondering if that should be changed kia ora that was my only part I Mr Beatty The, um, they're, they're like in, in regards to like the, the detail on the pages too, I think there's a, an, oh, that's omitted on page 85 in regards to less than, less than median on our own. Uh, that was, that, I think it's already been identified. Um, we, we can work that through before it's finally adopted and even if it means we have to, we can remove the reference to the source. Sorry, go ahead, Heather. Through you, Chair, it's already been amended to five. Any other questions or quarter? Because if not, oh, Councillor Tupara. Um, yes, just in terms of iwi, the use of the term iwi as a reflection of community broadly in the a graphic on page, whatever that page is, page nine. <clears throat> just a, a baby I think I thought of on the use of that term in, in, to reflect community. Um, and the other, which is an, another part there we might have mentioned before, um, particularly on page 30, if we're utilising um, images of our artists' work, can we acknowledge the artists in a little um, 
snippet alongside um, um, a, an attribution um, to the fine contribution that Arthur's making to our community. Artist acknowledgement on page 13. There's no other feedback. Do I have a mover for the paper? Moved by Councillor Robinson, second by Councillor Parata. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Um, take us to page 112, Triennial Elections. The noting report. Any I'll, question? I'll take the reporters read through the chair. Um, it's just our, our normal roundup of the elections that were. Um, and happy to take any questions. As, um, if, you have any. if there are no questions, do I have a mover for the paper? No. Moved by Councillor Gregory, seconded by Councillor Rio. No questions. I'll, I'll put the paper. All those in favour? No. All those against? Carried. Thank you very much, Mr. Beatty. I will bring that brings us to the last uh, paper on our agenda. I'd like to can sell a still in revise uh, to the front. So page 150, three waters reforms recent. <clears throat> Hello, the floor is yours. Morning, Apato. This lovely brisk morning where there was a frost on the ground. <laughs> um, thank you for the chance to address you about this. Uh, essentially, um, as you know, we've had uh, quite a bit of legislation come out around this whole water services reform um, process so far. So we've we've had the water services. Oh, oh, okay. regulator legislation. Okay. So we've we'll had the water services, um, water regulation legislation that established Taumata Otherwai, the independent drinking regulator, um, drinking regulator, drinking water regulator. <laughs> <laughs> We've had the, um, and we've had the water service entities governance legislation, which set up the water services entities that passed in December, the accountability and representation arrangements. And we've currently had, which we made a really comprehensive submission on, on two, two um, bills around the functions of um, these new water service entities and the economic regulation. That's what we've sort of seen to date. Um, yeah, the two bills currently in, in front of, um, the select committee will be coming back for sign off June, I think um, they'll be coming back to the house so we are expecting a new amendment bill in June and that's the bit that I want to talk about today, because it, it can get quite confusing with all of this stuff coming, you know, all around and it's amendments amending amendments, you know. So just to recap for you, this is the stuff that we have raised in the submissions from the GDC over the last two years. We've raised these points um, consistently um, over, several, over, over time. Um, our concerns about representation and accountability, affordability, um, council as planned um, makers and WSEs as planned takers, uh, the potential for confusion around stormwater roles and responsibilities. Um, also, stranded costs and the ongoing functions of councils with the residual activities um, and the transition process, both the speed and the approach to transition. Um, so what's changing is, uh, and you probably all heard this, is um, 10 water services entities now instead of four. So you'll see there it looks quite different. Um, Essentially, uh, Tairawhiti is uh, with our Hawke's Bay um, neighbours and one entity called Entity F. We don't, we're not going to say what the F stands for. <laughs> Fun, fantastic, fabulous. <laughs> um, so 
The second um, set of changes are this diagram, which I presented like last um, when we had a discussion in January. Pretty much, I think it's really important to note that all of the, most of the bill is, seems to be staying the same, but there's a really critical change in that red um, circle that I've highlighted there, which is around who's on the rep regional representative group. So now all territorial authorities will be represented. So uh, let's take, um, for instance, with our, we have five councils within Entity F. So there will be five re um, council representatives, one from each council on that. And there will be five mana whenua representatives to create that balance. It's really interesting. Um, there are a couple of, there's a lot of spin coming out at the moment from central government around this concept of co-governance. Um, and, and I think one of the ways that they are um, talking about the co-governance that's not co-governance um, is that there is to enable this balance sheet separation um, so that councils are not seen as having a controlling interest over these water services entities through these RRGs. Um, they are um, mana whenua play a critical role in that regard, those mana whenua representatives. So it's, um, yeah, be, it's very interesting to watch the undercurrents of what's happening in our country at the moment. Um, there's another change which we're very excited about around the transition timeframes. So as you see by the picture there, the current model was that everyone's going live by 1 July 2024 handing over the keys um, of the four entities. Now what they, um, with a bigger number of entities, it's going to be um, a little bit more complex. And so they have set this date, hard end date of 1 July, 2026, but they'll be staggering that transition. So different entities will be going at different times. Uh, Auckland and Northland are relatively unchanged from the previous model, so they're probably going to be starting, um, they're going to be piloting that transition starting this year, so they'll probably continue on their trajectory. Wellington Water is another one who has um, already got quite a cluster of councils together, so they may progress earlier. It does give us some um, opportunities to think about um, our priorities regionally, and especially in light of a recovery. The, um, something that wasn't in my paper but that kind of popped out of nowhere for us recently was this um, flying under the radar thing called community priority statements. Um, we don't know much about it, but it's been sort of hinted at and lost, it's been lost in, trans, lost in, the, in, the, in the noise a little bit. But, it's a, essentially a new mechanism that gives commu any community group, well, commun they've yet to define what's meant by a community group, um, that has an interest in a water body to have a chance to make a statement about what their values are in relation to that um, environmental priorities for that water body. So they make it really clear that, that these are not te mana or te wai statements. Um, but they are still working through the detail around how those things would fit with te mana o te wai statements um, and how um, the water service entities would be needing to respond to it. So they're going to come back to us in a month or so with some more detail. And that will be a really interesting space. Um, I'm going to talk about them a little bit more in a minute. Um, so what has not changed, as I said, um, they're still public, these water service entities are still publicly owned, so they're still um, very, very difficult to, to sell um, and privatise. Um, they're still operationally and financially independent. Uh, they still have their competency-based boards. They still have all of those mechanisms wrapped around them. Um, and they are still overseen by a regional representative group. That is, despite what government says, co-governed. So the summary, in summary, most has not changed, but some really important stuff, little bits have changed that will have big implications. And that is that um, implications for representation and accountability is probably the most critical one. 
Um, the minister, ministerial press release. So um, essentially what the minister, when they did their announcements on 13th of April was that, you know, we've heard you, lo um, local government, we've heard you that you're concerned about a loss of local voice and decisions and um, that they are recognising they do need to ensure that um, water service entities are more closely connected to the communities that they serve. I think it's finally kind of gotten through that water is not the same as um other utilities and stuff. It's uh, it's it's a it's different in the New Zealand context. We're not Scotland, um, so they will um, these 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 ten entities will mean a strengthened um, representation of uh, local communities. The regional advisory panels, which are the localized mechanisms, they still exist. So there's still also a very localized opportunity to feed up into the regional representative groups as well and influence the high level um, um, decision making. Affordability, so that, that um, representation and accountability change does result in a loss of economies of scale, um, which, um, so there is that trade off. They, um, there'll be 10 entities, so overall in terms of Aotearoa New Zealand, there will be more um, expensive to run these water services entities and there'll be more staff needed too. So we're gonna need, and that has implications for us as a council and for all councils in terms of supporting and staffing these entities. So I did wanna just draw some attention to these, um, those tables at the bottom are um, based on information that we have received that's in the public domain from the uh, DIA. And I'm confused and I have asked for, for clarification, but have not yet received any around why the cost assessment that they did in 2021 sees us by 2051, they, and let's, Pauline will tell you that we did not agree with the methodology that was used to identify how those, you know, those, the $8,690 cost for water services. Regardless of that though, how did we go from that figure in 2051 to 16,700 and by 2054, three years later? So, um, yeah, we, we, we just... Um, You'll come back to us with that? Yeah, I've asked the questions and then I've been told basically um, they haven't finished um, their assessments yet. So um, we do want to make sure that they are um, clear on the methodology and how they've arrived Did at you have something to say, Mr. Wilson? Yeah, so just on that for the council, this was quite contentious when this came out. For those of you who remember the Wix modelling that was done, we had significant concerns with the robustness of the data when that first came out, mm. and we started to work through that. However, we decided at the time it wasn't worth putting the time and energy in to rebut every single thing that was wrong that was in it because it was obvious that the reforms we needed to actually put our time and energy into understanding the case for change, stood up even though the numbers didn't, was the discussion that we had at the time around this. So there's significant concerns that we had with the first modelling, because um, it was nowhere near what we had in infrastructure strategies or anything doing what was proposed and what was there, particularly because for Tairawhiti mm. and how they'd come to that around everybody being connected up. And we were like, well, we wouldn't do that for this region because if you live all the way out the back of Tuparoa, we're probably not going to be putting a scheme in for one or two houses, but we'll work with you to make sure you have safe drinking water for your stuff going forward. So when you looked at the numbers and the way that it was done with the technology that was proposed, we had real fundamental disagreements with what was taken in that approach. So we didn't agree with them at the start, we still don't agree with them now. Yep, absolutely. And um Whereas they have used this, the, the question that I'm raising here is that they've used the same Wix modeling to do those two. So how come in three years, there is such a huge significant jump? So mm -hmm. we want answers to that question, mm -hmm. um, which is a fundamental, um, you know, and this is on the basis that our community, our households are gonna be paying this potentially. So, you know, we, they need clarity around what they're facing. Um, as you can see from it, the modeling says that um, 
under a four entity model, the promise was that the costs would be no greater than $1,260 per household per year. Those are now already under a 10 entity model looking at $4,010 um, by their modeling. So um, we're not sure what has changed that has pushed that up by that much. And so it, it is a concern, um, especially now that the, um, now that the reforms are now called the affordable water reforms. So more on that in a minute. Timing. Um, so we're still, this is a transition timing and, and, and the staggering. So we are still building the plane while flying it as the picture from my previous presentation shows, but we do have longer time before the plane lands to actually complete some of that building of that plane but we need to make sure we've got enough fuel, you know, so we need to make sure there's money and resources to keep the plane in the ground, off, off the ground. Yeah. Not judging, judging by the plane, I think we should have some emergency <laughs> services available too. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't catch Judging you. by the plane, we should have emergency services available too, as well as fuel. Yes, and um, there will definitely be ongoing transition <laughs> support required when the plane lands, crashes or whatever, mm -hmm. however it alights. <laughs> um, so I'm moving to this point, uh, these points around the potential submission points based on all of those um, potential changes. And I do want to have the caveat now that we don't know what's going to be in this bill. So there might be other stuff that they come in, come in with us with, and we'll just have to wait and see when it comes out. But now though, um, we were, um, affordability is still um, one of the things we've identified we really think recommend the councillors focus on because um, there is an opportunity to retain some of the economies of scale that um, from the previous model. So there are some operational matters um, in running a, an in, in entities across New Zealand that won't vary between entities. There are some standard processes of billing, recruitment, training and development of staff, um, fleet management, you know, legal advice, all of these kind of things that happen and that will not vary across New Zealand. Um, and that you could actually, at a national level, have a body delivering these so that the cost to the Yes, no, the rate pay, sorry, the water fee payers um, are, are efficient. So we, um, we are concerned that um, there are mechanisms within the bill such as, and I think my presentation in January talked about the role of subsidiaries and the potential to have these national level bodies that can deliver these shared services. Our concern is that um, that, that is reflected in the legislation um, now because if it's not, um, we run the risk of putting um, some of our people through an unnecessary change process mm -hmm. as they pull staff in to say, hey, we've got all these support roles, we need staff, and they pull our people into that process um, at which point, once once the bill is enacted and once the entities stand up, they go to a shared service model and our people are no longer needed in that. Um, and so there's a risk for our people, there's a risk mm. for council of losing those people, and there's a serious risk of reputational damage for the water services entities. Mm. So we want to see the shared services model actually legislated for or some assurances mm. that the bureaucracy that then takes over from these decision makers and puts this stuff is um, is really um, is is held in check, you know, to um, to deliver um, this shared services model. Um, we want to um, you to think about establishing the regional representative groups and boards um, and pushing have to have that done um, really quickly because the NTU is. Um, essentially making all these decisions um, in the interim. There is a longer transition period now. Um, and the more, the longer that a, that a board and um, governance layer is not established, 
the more that the NTU is having the influence on the shape and direction of the water services entities and the processes happening. And so, um, and those establishment processes, things such as constitutions, which will impact on, you know, the, um, the structure of the RRG, the number and um, nature of the regional advisory panels, those are critical things that will be mechanisms for local voice. That's where we have our flavour coming through in some of those things. So we want to um, advise that, um, that those um, governance um, structures that we push to have those established as soon as possible so that they can start to guide the transition throughout the transition as well. Um, and the timing of the transition we would assume would, to fit around recovery would be quite important. So figuring out um, what um, these entity F councils can actually do, um, rather than this being um, a directive that comes from government, we would want to be in a position to be able to say, this is the transition timeframe that we can meet practically on the ground in terms of our staff contributing and our ability to resource um, rather than nothing. So it's that whole concept of nothing about us without us. You know, that it's not something that's done to us. It's a partnership and it is a grown up conversation, not a parent telling a child off. Um, in terms of the community priority statements, um, we don't have much information about them at the moment, so we're not 100% sure. The biggest concern um, that I see from this is that we're not really sure why these things are not captured under the resource management framework, um, where there is a, you know, a, an ability to capture the community values for waterways in which our freshwater management planning, Joe, has done to the nth degree, I would imagine. And so, um, the, the it does undermine, and this is that whole concept that we've had all the way along around what's the interplay with council's functions for regulatory management as a unitary, you know, in the environmental management and the, and the um, so we think it is the potential to undermine the regional council's role in environmental management. But more than that too, the potential to water down Te Mana Ota Wai statements, um, which is, you know, the you know, everyone's invested so much time and energy to get these there, and then you bring something in from the side that has the potential to water down that. So um, we would suggest that um, you don't invent a new thing <laughs> when there's an existing mechanism because you're creating unnecessary com um, complexity, compliance, some, you know, different compliance mechanisms. Um, change the RN resource management mechanism to make it work in this in this instance and link the water service entity to that rather than creating a whole new special thing. Um, and the last thing is around the transition funding and support that um, that's the fuel to keep the plane in the air for the extended time. Um, we only have funding until 30th of June 23, um, so there's a black hole of info about how that's going to be peopled. Um, given the recovery effort at the moment, we um, have been getting an external consultants in to help us to support with pulling it, um, our information together to give to the NTU. Um, yeah, so it's um, just that ongoing um, support for that. So now I'm going to stop here, but I've got a couple more little bits of information about what I just really wanted to, to know what the discussion is around, around, yeah. So what, what you're, so just to get, uh, get it clear, what you're looking for from us yeah. is um, feedback Sorry. on if these potential submission yeah. points are in, in, on the right, um, yeah. uh, in, in the right frame. If you're able to take it back actually to, to I, the... I'll just, I will, I will finish then because I need to explain why we need to do that today. Yep. Yeah, because um, the bill is coming out in June. So the 30th of June is the last date that cabinet can uh, sort of approve something. And it's going to be a short select committee process. So we don't know if we're going to be able to actually get back in front of you um, before the submission comes out. So again, the same as the January, what happened in January, we're you know, concerned about getting the councillors across this, um, hence why we're coming to you today with a very vague understanding of what we think might come in front of us. Um, and then 
so they'll, the final reading will be by the 31st of August. So it will come, it's a fast, this mm. is a fast process. Mm. Um, there's no council meetings in July when we would be writing a draft submission. So essentially the bottom line is that we may not be able to come back to council with a draft submission before submitting it. And by that, I mean a, a formal council meeting. Um, yeah, so that's why we're doing this. Um, and important to note these things as well, that there is a general election in October and there may be further changes at that point. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Dot. Your worship. Um, I'm not sure what to call you. <laughs> Cheer. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so so what we're looking for in this discussion is if there's support or not, um, or any critique in regards to these potential submission points. Um, you're, are you looking for any expanding on any other things that might be top of top of mind for us as councillors? Yep, everything. Uh, just anything. to just to kind of create a bit of a framework in regards yep. to our discussion. I've seen Councillor Robinson's hand up. Uh, Councillor Foster, Telfer, Councillor Robinson. Hold up. Um, have we? So you spoke about standing up the WSE, WSEs as a priority. Right. Um, is there funding in place to do that? Our regional WSE. We have funding. To no. So. So on one hand, you're telling us that we should try to get them stood up as fast as possible so that you said it's not the child being told by so, the parents. So these W water service entities are um, are intended once they are established to be self-funding, but they will not be collecting rates or bill billing people, so to speak, until um, they go live the go live date. So they would not be able to be self-funding until that point. And ours was January 26, wasn't it? Um, no, um, there is a, that has not been decided yet, and that's what I mean by the, um, they have to be by 1 July 26. I, th I thought on that time frame it had. So that's the F. thing that I um, need to sort of clarify with you guys, that that was a model, an example of staggering, so it's a conceptual model, it is not, it is not, that will be worked out through the bill process, so that's just, was just an example to show you how the staggering would work. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry. Are you, can you share with us what the proposed process is for identifying the five Manu Whenua representatives for the F law here? Um, in the act, that is for Manu Whenua to decide. And what is council's proposal to participate in? How, how is council proposing to participate in that process, given there's clearly more than five Manu Whenua I know we've heard at least four iwi in Tairawhiti. Yeah, no, that's for Mana Whenua to um, work together and figure out amongst themselves. There is no involvement of council in deciding or engaging in their representation. We stick to our knitting. We've got our own things um, to decide our own representation um, as a region. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. We have Councillor Foster and Councillor Telford. Yeah, thank you. Um, since you talked to us last time, there's still so much cloud. <laughs> and I don't think a lot of, no, I mean, not, no, no disrespect for you. I, I appreciate your position, but I mean, you know, there's no, there hasn't been a lot, a lot of progress happening really. And um, um, we're still in the dark of what actually is going to be defined in, in, in this transition of our water. Um, for a start, you know, there's, it's, it's talking about territorial authorities. Well, you've got um, Napier City and, um, and Hastings City, that are not territorial authorities, the Hawke's Bay Regional Council is their territorial authority, and that's with Wairau as well. So for me, that's that's us, and, and the Re Hawke's Bay Regional Council would be the two councils involved, unless there's a different definition of territorial authorities, that's one. Um, the other one is that, you know, we've just gone through Cyclone Gabriel and um, stormwater and flood control is, is a major. And, uh, you know, they, are, they were so flawed in all areas and, you know, didn't take any capacity whatsoever to create a huge environmental mess. And, and um, where are the solutions going to be for under this umbrella to, to, for us to be guaranteed that this transition is going to help with bigger pipe capacity, better rural drainage, and where's the, where's the, um, the cutoff between stormwater and flood control? 
as well. You know, I mean, there's there's a lot of this is there's, this is a huge transition for this council and its staff, and there's still no definite direction that we're we're supposed to be going in. I'm afraid. I, I mean, and I know I know you're working hard behind the scenes, but I I can sense you're just as confused as what we are because. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean you know. Given, given the information on coming from um, from head office from go, from government because they don't know what's happening on the ground obviously in this region and in Hawke's Bay and and to group us in an F oh fine you know but what does it mean what does that what actually does it mean when it comes to our wastewater storm water and um, drinking water delivery you know they're saying it's going to be better off prove it how, how can they do that they haven't proven anything to us to me anyway at, at the moment. So you know, I'm still, I'm still really um, um, not supportive <laughs> of this direction. Even though it's not not my call, it's way beyond my call, unfortunately. But if I did have the call, I would be saying status quo and give us the funding to do what we need to do for our local community here and our region. Because creating all these different um, entities and bureaucracy is just going to be more cost effective, more, more costly, I would imagine. How can it be cost effective? So anyway, I'll leave it there because I could go for a long time, but you know, I'm not convinced. Thank, thank you, Councillor Foster. Did you want to respond in regards to the stormwater? Yes. So in regards to the stormwater, that is still what needs to be worked out between DIA and all of the local authorities in the country. So. Councillor Foster's raised a really contentious issue around where does stormwater start and finish? When do we get into what we have here in Tairawhiti around our rural um, schemes that we have, but then also the levels of service that we need to look to review after Cyclone Gabriel. So that's part of the things that need to be worked out. And I suppose the caution that I'd give the council is we don't know what we don't know yet. There is a whole lot of things that need to be ironed out and that's what DIA is working frantically to do. So until we get that report back, it's very difficult for us to anticipate the levels of detail that we're all waiting for, but we need the legislation to set up that framework for us to then be able to give you some detailed advice as to what the implications are for the legislation. So we're trying to give you as much as we know, um, which is very little at the, if we're honest, because we're waiting to see exactly what these 10 entities look like. Also, what some of the benefits or cons could be of going into a water services entity sooner rather than later, we actually need to give you some considered advice around if the transition is happening, what is the best time frame, yeah. time frame for Tairawhiti to join that scheme? Is it sooner? Is it later? And you'll need to have that as part of your considerations for your long-term plan, but also what's the best outcome for the community as we work towards that. So we know there's a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of answers yet because we need that legislation to drop. Once it does, happy to convene a meeting with you to be able to talk through that, even if it is in between council meetings, to be able to try and bring you up to speed as quickly as we can. So, so just, just to clarify, it's um, that this wouldn't be something that we would submit in regards to one of our potential submission points. This can be. Yep. Because I, that was more of where I was taking the steer from um, from Council Foster's, like really just landing our concern in regards to in regards so to that and just, just reaffirming that. There are a number of things that are in the um that are that are, that we would want to raise that are not in the bill, such as transition support funding, such as the role, um, the interplay with council's roles, things that we've been saying all the way along, um, and we'll think of um, different in other ways to say the same things that we have been saying to make sure that there is that, that clarity, because it's our opportunity to have our voice heard on something that they may be able to address, not necessarily through legislation, but through a change in how they're approaching the transition. So we just want the ministers to hear um, our concerns in general, and one of them is around the stormwater. So we'll use every opportunity that we can to get those points across. Sure, thank you, Ms. Kinsella. So uh, next, I have uh, Councillor Telford then Councillor Rear. Yeah. Oh, Microphone, uh, please. Then Councillor Tupac. Oh, just get out. Um, my concerns, but yeah, look, I, I'm just. Um, I, I think we all just. We all realise we're running blind in a lot of this. There hasn't. We haven't had any financial analysis put around. Um, to show us how Tarafati is going to be um, better off, how this model is going to 
and, and Larry brought it up, there's a real risk. Um, I don't know how these decisions on allocation within this body are going to be made, whether it's going to be on population based or um, because if it is, we're dead, dead in the water up here. Um, so I, I just, you know, and like Larry said, we've got a Hawke's Bay Regional Council and we've got a unitary authority here. So is that two bodies um, or is it five plus one? So, you know, I, I am concerned about that. Um, but like I say, we haven't had that information put in front of us to even show that, that, that you're modeling there on, on the on within three years using the same matrix, um, the numbers changed like double, I think it was, if I remember rightly. Look, you know, it's very, very easy to put a number in for 2050. I could put a number in to say, you know, the price of beef in 2050 is going to be such and such, and who can hold me accountable for it? So, look, I think we need to put put a bit of perspective around those numbers. Um, yeah, you know, trying to predict that sort of stuff is way out there. I'd like to see some more a modeling around, right, how is this going to change within five years? Because if we can't see that sort of a change and, and, and then have some gauges on to be able to um, turn around to our this um, WEC and say, you said under this model that this is where we'd be, we're not going to sit here until 2050 and say, oh, that's a failure, because we've just seen that in this, in this report that's just come around about decisions that were made 30, 40 years ago. Um, and now we're sitting here going, oh, how did that happen? Uh, look, come on, we need some, a bit more. Because to sign something off and say, yeah, we agree with it under the, what's been supplied to us so far is just really solid. I understand the, the, the need to set this up, but um, you know, I, I don't think we should sign that off the same because we agreed to set it up, we're agreeing with it. Thank you, Councillor Tuff. So I, I guess the takeaway there is um, the, the potential submission point around uh, the forecasting is out 30 years. We want that forecasting to, you know, if they can provide us with forecasting for yeah. that shorter term, we we'll to be able to make some more. I um, wanted you to know as well that um, as per the previous presentation, we are doing an impact assessment, um, which is our own modelling of the costs too. So even if they don't do that forecasting, we'll be looking at that. Um, in some way. Um, yeah, so I'll definitely make a note of that. We'll put it in the submission, but we'll also take note of it for our own internal report. Thank you. Councillor Rea, then Councillor Tupara. Thank you, Mr Chair. Kia ora tato. Um, I totally agree with my two mates to the right of me, and I just want to be really clear too, is that um, the, the confusion around this that we as councillors are feeling are not because of your report, you know, yes. are not, they're not because of what you have provided us. We are very clear that right from day dot, when we started receiving information from the government, it was cloudy, it was not specific, it had not enough detail. And so it's taken one step, I suppose, now they're giving little bits of details, but it's still not enough for us to be able to make good judgment calls and plan for the future in terms of um, the why and the entity and all of that. Um, I would like to um, be as late as possible to the party of, um, of this kaupapa so that we can see how it's going to work out in other regions, um, that they can iron out some of the um, uh, imperfections uh, because it is so grey. So if they can iron that out on other regions, I would like to wait as long as we can to become a part of the, the whole picture. Um, yes, but I thank you for your report. Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor Ria. Councillor Tupo. <coughs> I do support the concern around um, the dilution of te mana o te wai statements. Um, I don't know how you can dilute water even further, but um, I, I'm very concerned that the, the whole direction of this waka will change on that definition. And the reason that Council Tairawhiti came in um, in support of, of this is because of the direction that that waka was on. And, and my concern is that the, any dilution of that is becoming something else. And that we, we should reserve the right to withdraw um, from our earlier decisions around this, should the cloud not be lifted, or in fact, the direction once the cloud is lifted is in a completely different direction to where we thought this was um, going. And I do take Councillor Telford's um, 
point that um, the purpose of this was to improve our capability to supply water to our community. And it does appear, even with the little details that are coming through, it seems like even more of a burden on our community that already exists. And so it seems almost a pointless water journey in that. In terms of pointlessness, um, I take what uh, Councillor Foster has already indicated, there are only two territorial authorities involved in this. Yet in terms of co-governance, there are five um, council positions. And um, I'm perplexed at why that is the case. But given that um, just previously we talked about, in fact, um, there are at least seven iwi in the Te Rafati. And so um, the mana whenua that lies east of the Raukumara and the Tuene Mountains is fast in number, fast in spread, and um, they're expected to go on into an equation of determining their representation on territorial authority representation. Where in fact, I would suggest that it might be more equitable if in fact the territorial authority divided it up according to the iwi half of that co-governance. And it places an undue burden in my view on mana whenua and their representation. And is in fact a dilution, not only of the mana o te wai, but also the mana o te whenua. And um, I, I can't see the logic of, of how this co-governance entity will work if in fact the scales of balance are already out off kilter from the very beginning. And in terms of um, potential submission points, I'd like to hope that we can make um, that point. Because the going back to the affordability um, remaining critical for mana whenua, that's going to be phenomenal um, cost impacts on those organisations. One, we don't have mana whenua entities. We have iwi entities, and they have very little resource. And so their ability to participate is going to unnecessarily burden on them. But if, and, and the, the terminology again for me, mana whenua as an entity of participation in a regulatory authority such as this simply doesn't exist. Someone in Wellington has just made that up. We don't have a mana whenua a mea a mea a rohe a rohe. We are iwi based, hapu based, and um, and I'm not going to speak for the motu, but here in the Tairafiti, that is a significant way in which we distribute our cultural contributions back to our wider community. And that seems to be lost, even in the little details that's been shared today. But I do appreciate the amount of work that's going into this and that continues to go into this. And as um, the Councillor Rea pointed out, this is of no reflection at all on the efforts of staff, um, but just on the frustration really that's been felt around this table since this was put on Council's table. So for that, Kia ora. Um, I just wanted to clarify, I'm sorry if I, if I made this, um, didn't make this clear, that the um, the territorial authorities are actually the dis at the at the lowest the lowest level. Oh God, that sounds terrible. The finest scale level of 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 govern governance. So that's us, Wide War District Council, Hastings District, Central Hawke's Bay District, and Napier City. Those so all of those councils would be represented. Would be represented. Regional councils would not. So Hawke's Bay region would not, and GDC would not. Um, have a regional as well as a local representative. So, so yes, that is all represented. So there's five and they, we're all represented. Um, in terms of the mana whenua process, if it makes you feel any better, there is not the, there is no, nothing I can see in the act at the moment, and we will, can look out for it in this new bill as it drops, that says that mana whenua has to be from the same place. So every council has a mana whenua rep. There's nothing in there that says that at all. 
what it says is, is that for the whole rohe of entity F, mana whenua or mana whenua within that will decide who their five representatives will be. So you could have four from Taira Awhiti, and that'd be great, and one from Kahunganu, for instance, or something like that. So if that makes a difference. I did want to ask just a little bit, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, that's fine. I did want to just clear, um, ask for clarification of your point, um, Councillor Tuipara. Are you, could, do, are you think saying that we should have all mana whenua represented at the table or are you, what was your concern around that? Because I just want to be really clear. The way we currently represent Māori and our rohe is through iwi or iwi authority. And not, there isn't such a thing as a mana whenua authority. And so they do get an opportunity to invent whatever that might look like. Um, but I think this, this, the scale, for me, really the scale of that representation against the local authority, because it seems quite clear that that equation is based on the territorial authority um, proportion. Because I believe there are more iwi than territorial authority. And there's a burden for them to dilute themselves to create a thing which doesn't exist called mana whenua from Paul to Kirua to the Wairarapa and um, say, here is our version of that for you. And, that, and, and as you clearly point out, that, that will be put into their, their space. That is a horrifying um, position to put our people in. And, um, and then they have to dilute to match the number of territorial authorities or way we're defining what a territorial authority is. That's just a terrible burden to put them, to put their way. And I, I think it's, it's too broad much to say, they get to decide that, as if that is a good thing. And, and it's kind of setting them up to fail. We made statements at uh, yesterday's session about um, put, requiring council to make positions that it can't live up to. And now we're saying to mana whenua, to our people, here's, we couldn't give it to you, it's up to you, you decide, and it's setting them up in my view to make it so difficult for them that the, 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 the debate that will happen through that whole rohe will diminish the contribution and value they're able to bring to the process. Thank you very much, Councillor Tupara. Councillor Gregory. Oh, just very quickly, um, one of the things that has come up, um, and I get, it's a detail about the collection of that of the water rate that the water entity will um, obviously need from ratepayers, um, and it's been suggested that it might happen through council. And I just want to say I'm really opposed to that situation because whoever that person pays the money to, they're gonna suspect that they're going to look after their service. And I'd really like to think that if it gets that far, we would push back on that really hard. And the other uh, thing is, uh, I suppose the election in October could bring a whole new thing for us to look at, which must be difficult for staff to be constantly uh, transforming thoughts and things around what's happening in Wellington. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Gregory. Councillor Thompson? Yeah, pre pretty much what's been said. Well, I just want the community to know that this is something that's been forced upon us with little to no input, yep. um, with, with no detail. So it's hard to support something you, you know nothing about. I personally can't see it ending well. I'd love to be proven wrong but yeah i can't see how it's going to be cheaper or anything else and to me it's yet another thing taking control locally and centralizing it it's yet another thing to centralize everything so yeah i just want to point out that i'm not in support of this councillor parata yeah i mean it, it doesn't feel like we're in control um of the direction or, or really anything of I want to um, yeah support what's being said at the table. Um, I enjoyed the presentation, but it was the same as the last presentation that it is complex. It's so complex um, where we fit in this great big picture. Um, I also support what um, Councillor Gregory is saying about if we send the invoice 
they assume it's our service. Yes. Um, and I think it's very important that the people, the constituency, the customers that receive the service know who's providing that service to them. Yes. Um, whilst I, I, we cannot dictate um, the mahi of our, our staff, I think it's really important that um, our communications team is aware um, and make sure that there's a campaign in place um, to inform inform our people of the mahi we do and the mahi we do not do um, in terms of this so that um, we aren't copying flack that we don't we are not responsible for being a representative doesn't mean that we're actually responsible for the delivery of the service and whānau will not understand that if we do not make an effort to educate them um, but other than that support the mahi that's happening and also I'm compassionate to the fact that this is a never changing space continues continuous change and maybe more change on the horizon so I'm compassionate to the fact that lots and lots of thinking and mahi has gone into this and appreciate um, the presentation. Councillor Parata, if there are no other, oh, just, sorry, just final one, comments here. Um, yeah, just one thing on that, it's, if we do go later in the piece, um, the billing systems and stuff will largely be set up um, for other entities, so there's a much greater chance that we won't have to go through, do that pass through billing. Um, Councillor uh, Pahuru Huriwai. Thank you, Chair. I just want to total for the sentiments of um, Councillor Prata and Councillor Thompson, also Councillor Gregory, and and um, or actually everybody really same position. And I think um, just want to acknowledge the mahi that's gone into this event and to try and keep a handle on everything, keep us and bring back the information to us. Um, you know, can. I totally understand the frustration um, and also the uncertainty on staff um, at this time. Um, who knows what two o'clock will bring about in the budget? Mm. Um, who knows what the elections will bring about also? So it is a real time of uncertainty and just want to acknowledge that. Um, uh, also support Councillor Rhea's view around coming in later rather than sooner. Um, just in regards to seeing what else is, what we, where other people are at, rather than being like the first cab off the rank in this instance, because there's so much um, grey areas, uh, used to just sit back for a little bit, not too late. But I've just got to watch, watch what's happening in the space, and I know you will be. So, tēnā koutou. Thank you, Councillor Pahuru Huri. Why I haven't had a go yet, so I'm going to have a go. Um, the, I've, the only piece of feedback that I have in regards to the uh, potential submission points is around the, those community priority statements. It's really questioning who defines the community and how those communities are, are, are defined. That, I think that's uh, um, you're, you're right in regards to what those, how problematic those potential statements could be for statements that already exist, like Te Mano o Te Wai. Even before that, uh, I'm, I do have a concern in regards to the communities that they're referring to. So it would be, be great if we're able to um, put that up as a potential submission point as well. Um, Councillor Robertson, real quick, just to get to the end, the end of the paper. Councillor um, Robertson. What do our friends in the Hawke's Bay have to say about this? Where are they thinking it's going to land? Are they, are they asking the same questions as us? Are they, your, your colleague down south, are they sort of sharing the same concerns and frustrations? What are their councillors telling them? I'm not sure what their councillors are telling them. I only know what, who I'm dealing with at the operational level and that's not really what you're asking. <laughs> and and, and uh, I, I guess I can ask it because I, I, went to, I went to zone three um, I was our representative of Zone 3, and they share similar feedback and concerns that we we also do as a, um, as a council. Um, I, I, there, I, I do want to echo, I do want to reiterate too, that this is a process that is being done to us. Um, there isn't the, what well, we've been vocal in regards to actually our pushback ar uh, around this, this idea. And now those now these bills, um, but yeah, it's it's steamrolling ahead. So I'm feeling like it will. Yeah, it, it is. It's it's going to be a thing. I, I agree with the in with the sentiment around the table that 
I'm equally as worried. E equally as worried. Um, but yeah, the, the what we we've been really strong in regards to our feedback here around this table, uh, around our concerns. Uh, I'm sure Ms. Kinsella has, has picked up on those and will will place those concerns uh, as submission points to these bills every single time, uh, every single time. So thank you very much for that, Ms. Kinsella. I want to bring us to page um, page 151, just noting that this is a noting report, so noting the contents of the report. Do I have a mover? Moved by Councillor Robinson, seconded by Councillor Foster. So uh, no other questions or comments? Oh, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll put the paper. Uh, all those in favour? All those against? Carried. Um, this brings us to the end of our agenda. I would like to um, thank staff, thank councillors and thank presenters for your participation today. It's been a, been a great meeting. We, we uh, yeah, there, there was a lot of really good stuff that came out of today's meeting. I really want to acknowledge everybody for their participation today. Um, and, on, and on that note, I will close our meeting. Kia ora tato. Head off, please. Yeah.